Hey there. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday School uh, for True Deliverance Holiness Church, where Bishop Nolan T. Torbert is the pastor, founder, and overseer. This lesson today is one that is not one people like to really teach on from this particular book, the book of Lamentations, because they see it as, uh, I don't know, a sad book, and they see it as a book of woe and sorrow. But it's a book of consequences. Uh, this particular chapter we're, we're going to be studying today is something that happened to the people of God as a result of the lifestyle they had chosen to live. A lifestyle that was completely contrary to the Word of God and to the laws of God, the standards of the kingdom. Anytime we go against the Word of God and we decide to run in a direction uh, that's absolutely contradictory to what we were told to do, uh, in the word of God, there are going to be consequences. Uh, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Don't be marked. Don't be fooled. Don't be received. Whatsoever a man sows, that's exactly what he's going to reap. Sometimes it's a whole lot more than they sowed. But our lesson today is coming from Lamentations chapter 5, and the subject is the nation's plea. And this is a series, uh, Prophets Faithful to God's Covenant, is Unit 2, and uh, we're talking about Prophets of Restoration. And this is the eighth lesson of this series. As a matter of fact, it's the last lesson of this particular unit, Unit 2. And I'm going to jump right on in because there's a lot to cover. And in verse number 1 of Lamentations 5, it's talking about confrontation. And they want the Lord to remember. Look at what it says in verse 1. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. Now, I'm going to, again, stay as much as I can in our commentary, the King James annual commentary, with my notes. Asking God to remember is not a plea for him to recall information as if he forgotten. They wanted him to help them out of the trouble that they had found themselves in. Now, this is as a result of what they had done. When it says, consider and behold, they both echo the word remember. And when you put these three verbs together, they, co they convey a real sense of urgency. And they wanted the God to come and see, come and see about them, come and see what was happening to them, and they wanted God to come without delay. The phrase, what has come upon us, suggests that the people saw themselves uh, as passive recipients of the tragedy that they were going through. Passive recipients, as if it was something that just happened as a result and of nothing they had done, which was not the case. Now, we're not being unsympathetic here. We're simply saying this was a consequence of a sinful lifestyle that the majority had adopted. 
But Lamentations 1 and 5 reveal that their circumstances, as they describe them, as I just mentioned, was a result of the sin that they decided to wallow in. And yes, that's what happens a lot, is that people decide not only to just sin, but they decide to wallow in the sin and, uh, and never change and repent and keep doing the same thing. And that just, that's not going to get the job done. In verse number two, our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. The promised land was God's gift to Abraham and it was God's gift to his descendants. You read about that in Leviticus and in Leviticus 25, 13 through 16, and 23 through 34, and in Numbers 36, 7 through 9, they had laws in place to ensure that the Israelite families would not lose their land forever. So we can see then, and we can only imagine how devastating it was to see their inheritance with all the, the, the ordained safeguards in place, still fell in the hand of people that were outside of the covenant. Think about that. Think about if somebody, if somebody comes in and just takes your house, takes your, your car, takes your family, just take it. They come into your house, take over the kitchen, take over the television, take over... Uh, any convenience you have in your house that the Lord bless you with as a result of something that, that, uh, that you would have done or we would have done. That's a bad feeling. You can only imagine. Verse number three, we are orphans and fatherless. Our, our mothers are as widows. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, and chapter 24, verses 19 through 21, Orphans and widows were protected under God's covenant. They were to be taken under the wings of the community so they could live in what they call less than ideal situations and conditions. And we read in Exodus chapter 22 and 24 and Jeremiah 15 and 8 and 18 and 21 how God's warnings and judgment end up resulting in widows and orphans. So the widows and orphans were protected under the covenant. But as a result of, of, of warnings and judgments and the sins, that's exactly where they ended up, with kids with no fathers, but with, with women with no husbands, with no covering. And it led them in a bad place. Verses 4 through 6 says, We have drunken our water, our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Look at this situation now. Paying for money, paying money for their own possessions. How would it look if you had to go to your house and pay for food in your refrigerator? It's your food. You got to pay. How would it, would it make sense that you had to pay to, to use your own car to go to work? And, 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 and they, paying, they paid that to the Babylonians which indicates that uh, Judea had lost control of their gift. What was their gift? It was the promised land that God had gifted to Abraham and his descendants. They had lost control of that. In Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68, we see the other side of the coin, the blessing coin. You know, we love to read the first 14 verses. but We don't read verse 15 through 68 too much. That's a side of curses as a result of disobedience. You know, everybody loves to talk about the good days, the good old days. We love to talk about um, 
prophesying blessing in houses and land and cars. But we don't, we don't talk too much about the process. We talk about the destination. We talk about the progress. We generally don't talk about the process. We don't talk about the journey through the wilderness. We just talk about the promised land. But there's, the other, there's another side to the coin. And this is, this is a hard, what they're dealing with now is a hard reminder of the persecution and the slave labor that the Israelites experienced in Egypt. You read about that in Exodus chapter 5. But now after the Lord delivered them from Egyptian, Egyptian bondage, he also delivered to them his laws in Exodus chapter 20. But they chose, they chose another path. And when they chose another path, they suffered the consequences. And they were so desperate for help that they turned to the very people that oppressed them. They turned to the Assyrians. They turned to the Babylonians that did not even believe in God. And this was the same group that oppressed them. Let's look at that. Let's look at that in Hosea chapter 7, verse 11. Let's just kind of read an example here. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version, Hosea 7, 11. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart or good sense. They call to Egypt for help. They go to Assyria. Now, you know, this is amazing. And that's why we have to all be careful where, you go, where, you, where we go for help when in trouble. You got to be careful what, what, who, where you lay your head when you're lonely and where you eat when you're hungry. Let me just say that again. You got to be careful where you lay your head when you are lonely and where you eat when you're hungry or you forget your name. Okay? You're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that right there. Verse 7. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Part of the reason for this generational suffering was the passing down uh, of sinful behaviors and the passing down of sinful habits. You know, our kids are always watching everything that we do, everything that we say, and somebody said, well, he's just like his father. He's just like his, she's just like her mother. And when they say just like father, mother, they're not giving them a compliment either. They're talking about a negative attitude, a negative disposition, because they see what their father or mother do, and that's exactly what that child is doing. And, you, you know, you tend to get mad at the child, but the child is doing what, they, what they've seen, imitating. They pass down behavior that was, that was sinful and also habits, and these things require the attention of God. You read about it in Jeremiah 14 and 20 and 16 and 12. For generations, the Lord had warned the people, you know, without judgment. And he promised to withhold the punishment if the people would just quit acting up. You know, just turn, repent. But for a long time, they decided not to do that. And you read in Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8, and Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. The Babylonian exile was extremely depressing on the people. They had lost their land. They had lost their freedom. They had lost their voice. And in the book of Lamentations, we see a witness of how terrifying that judgment was. But the Babylonians, who God used as a judgment stick, so to speak, a whipping stick, overstepped their role in carrying out what God had called them and decreed for them to do. They overstepped their role in carrying out the judgment of God, and God got them too. God got the people that he had to get the people. Because the people that God 
uh, elected to bring judgment on, the, on his people Israel, the Babylonians, stepped out of bounds, did more than he had decreed for them to do. And you read in Isaiah chapter 47 and Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 20. Verses 8 through 10, servants have ruled over us. There's none that deliver us out of their hands. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin is black like an oven because of the terrible famine. The people taken to Babylon were ruled not by Babylonian officials and leaders. They were ruled by Babylonian servants. Babylonian slaves ruled the people of God. And those who remain in Judah endured the shame of being governed by foreigners within the borders of the promised land. So, so they had foreigners to come to their land and govern and rule them in their borders. You imagine how shameful that had to have been. So bread then could have been the only thing at that time that they had to eat in the promised land that was, that was flowing with milk and honey. With mi with no milk and honey at this time because, uh, again, as a result of the sin that they had decided to continue to do, they lost access. You see, you don't want to lose access and 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 that can happen very easily the sword represents all the violence that that robbed them of their safety the sword represents all the violence that robbed them of their peace the wilderness refers to the real dangers of trying to harvest in that land trying to find food in the promised land the oven could talk about could refer to the extremely hot weather it says our skin was black and it calls to mind when you try to cook something, you burn it, just burn it to a crisp. The hunger that resulted from the famine, that hunger that resulted from the lack in the land resulted in all kind of disease and sickness. You know, people, if you don't, if you don't eat right uh, and eat any and everything, it's going to have an effect on how you look. It, it's going to affect your skin. It can affect uh, your energy level. It can affect your ability to think. These people had a lack of the necessities. And listen, you don't live to eat, but you do eat to live. And if we don't have the proper nutrition, uh, nutrients, and people don't, don't really believe that. They don't think that, uh, you hear folks say that you are what you eat. Well, in a real sense, that's true. And, and these people did not have those bare necessities, those things that they needed to keep them living. As I mentioned a moment ago, we, you know, we don't live to eat, but we do eat to live. So look at verse 11 through 12. They ravish. Now, this is when I read this, I said, wow. They ravish the women in Zion and the maids in the city of, Ju of Judah. Verse 12, princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces of elders were not honored. So the women, whether they were married or single, they still suffered sexual violations, and the husband could not even cover their own wives. <sighs> you know, even though God's laws in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and 25 through 29 warn against sexual violence, that didn't mean nothing to those people that came down to violate the Babylonians, didn't care anything about the word of God. They didn't believe in God. And they violated the women, uh, single or married. You can only imagine how humiliating that was for the men that uh, had saw their own wives being violated and could not do anything about it. Ooh. Even the princes, the, the, you know, the princes who represented the, the entire empire, the princes, 
that represented the kingdom and the advisors did not receive any kind of special treatment because of their positions of authority. As a matter of fact, they were executed and humiliated in the broad, open public view, for, for public view. And they did that just to remind the people that your leaders ain't got no power, your leaders ain't got no ability, your leaders ain't got no influence. They do what we tell them to do, or we tell them not to do. And they, to, to prove that, they hung them in the, in the public view. So, uh, this also included the disrespect, the Babylonians really disrespected the older people, and we learn in our commentary that the elders were also likely uh, executed publicly. This was a dog day in the, in, the, in the people of God's lives. Verse 13 and 14, they took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. So what we see here is the image of falling under the burden of sin. We see the image of the weight of the punishment of judgment. Even the children were doing work that was way too hard for them to do. We read in Ruth chapter 4 verses 1 through 12 that in the gates of the city of Jerusalem, elders congregated uh, at the main gate to make decisions on legal cases and business agreements, etc., etc. But now there's a complete upheaval of the government. The lack of traditional music also indicates a cultural a cultural disruption. Their way of life, their way of doing things, the joy, the happiness, when the men played the music, all that had been changed. The men were doing the things that were generally uh, set aside for female slaves at that time. The men were doing their jobs. They were not playing the music. So there was a, a change in culture, a change in government a complete disruption of their way of life by a foreign community that came in, came in and did not even believe in God because God used them to let the people know you can't do what you want to do. Verse 15 and 16, the joy of our heart is cease. Our dance is turned into mourning. The crown is falling from our head Woe unto us that we have sinned. Now we see confession. You hear folks that confession equals possession, and confession is good for the soul. But see, sometimes we can allow ourselves to get so far gone. If we're not careful now, we get, just get so far into it, and, and we're too, we can be, if we're not careful, we can be too stout-hearted. We can be too prideful to say, I'm sorry, and what I did was wrong. But, but hard time and, and, and trouble will make anything, anybody, admit that they were wrong. They said for we, that we have sinned. So these, these two verses summarize the societal and the governmental disorganization that the people were experiencing. It was no organization in their society, their culture. The government also was disrupted and corrupted. And the crown represents the kingdom. It represents the, 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 the monarchy. And it also represented Judah itself. They had mourners. Bishop talked about mourners last Sunday. You know, you got, they had professional mourners. Uh, they had claim that they had suffered from the sins of their fathers, from previous generations. But here, here, they take personal responsibility. And that's something a lot of folks don't like to deal with. And I know we're not going to finish this lesson today, so I'm not going to even try to go all the way to the end. I don't think we're going to finish it. But a lot of folks don't like to deal with personal responsibility. Listen, 
it, it saves a lot of time when a person just admits that they the problem. And if they don't change, the problem that they're experiencing ain't going to get no better. You see, verse 17 and 18, for this, our heart is faint. For these things, our eyes are dim because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. So the weakness of their heart and the of, of their eyes resulted from the faith the situation in the mountain of Zion. The mountain of Zion uh, was a particularly memorable place. And it was a place that they had great memories as a result of what they had at one time. In this same place, David defeated the stronghold of the Jebusites. You read about that in Joshua chapter 15 and also 2 Samuel chapter 5. In this same place, uh, David built his palace there. And in this same place, the temple was built there. But this place now, this mountain of Zion, was a place of desolation. It was a place of no consolation. It was a place of intimidation by a foreign people, the same place where all these memories reside, had gone to another place now. And they had lost their place in the place, the promised land was no longer a land of promise. It was a land of defeat, a land of desolation, a land of devastation because of the, the lifestyle they had chose to live. The people mourned for the fate of the city, the monarchy, the kingdom, the temple. It had gotten so bad that where foxes just roamed around in the city, the capital city, and it just was another indication of the profound desolation of Jerusalem because of the sin that they had they chose to do verse 19 and 20 though thou O Lord remainest forever thy throne from generation to generation wherefore doest thou forget us forever that's the question they they pose unto the Lord and forsake us for so long a time you know the city this call to the Lord now is a, a brief moment of praise yeah he sit, he sits on the throne he's in complete control he knows everything from generation to generation he also knew and know knows when they sin from generation to generation he also knows all the prophets he sent to them from generation to generation that they decided not to listen to so they had an overwhelming pain and when they pose these questions here, the pains that they were experienced at the time of these questions was overwhelming. And sometimes trouble can get that way. Trouble can be so trouble, so troubling to where trouble can trouble trouble. And uh, when it gets to that point, oh my goodness, it's in a rough place. Verse 21 and 22, we got to rush through this now because we're really uh, getting out of time if we're not out of time. I think last week I went five minutes over. My wife said, you know, you went five minutes over last week. I said, what? Yep, you went five minutes over. Turn down to us, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Verse 22, but thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art wroth, very wroth with us. You see, class, I'm going to put it, I'm, I'm going to have to put it down. You know, you don't want to make the Lord mad, okay? You can make me mad. You can make your employer mad. But let's not make the Lord mad. Because all your employer can do is terminate you. All your kinfolk can do is get mad at you for a while or just stay mad at you. That's all they can do, you know. Uh, or they can injure you physically in some way. But the Lord can do a whole lot more than injure you physically in some way. The Lord can destroy the body and the soul and put both of them in hell. And so let's, let, let's mind the way that we live. I know we're not back in, in that time, and I know we have grace and truth. We have mercy, and we thank God that uh, we're not living under the law. But the Bible is our schoolmaster. The Word of God, all scriptures are given by inspiration of the prophets and also given for us for education and edification. Everything happened for a reason. 
And so let's not just look over and say, oh, that's just, why in the world are they talking about t teaching from, from Lamentations? I feel sad after Lamentations. Well, we're going to show enough feel sad if we don't change our lifestyle and live the way God ordains for us to live. Now, next week, we're going into a new series, and it's Speaking Truth to Power is our next week's lesson. And we're still talking about prophets faithful to God's covenant, but we're going into Unit 3, and we're going to be looking at Courageous Prophets of Change. Now, the month of May got five lessons. So y'all hang on in, hang on in there and keep plugging in. We'll see you hopefully in Sunday in church today, and we'll see you if the Lord says the same for Sunday school on next Sunday. Take care.